Hey, Margie here. I'm such a big believer of taking an integrative approach when it comes to osteoporosis and bone loss. And there's many pieces to this puzzle. And it, oftentimes it can be confusing and overwhelming. Well, we're going to delve into this today and really try to clear things up with our special guest, Dr. Kim Millman. And Dr. Millman is a Stanford UCSF USC trained integrated medicine physician and research scientist. She has been working for 15 years in her thriving medical practice to help women with bone loss discover why their bones are thinning, reverse the root cause, and give them natural strategies to strengthen their bones. She has spent the last 10 years researching, developing, and implementing some of the most novel natural treatment regimens for bone loss, and is one of the only doctors that specialize in an integrative approach to bone loss in this country. Through her work as a research scientist, she has developed personalized dosing strategies for calcium, vitamin D, and other minerals that have advanced personalized medicine for bone health. It's her mission to help women with bone loss understand that they can heal naturally and not let fear hold them back from living their best and most active lives. They can go from feeling fragile, frustrated, and frightened to empowered and confident so they can, can take control of their bone health and continue to do things they love to do. And that's all what I'm about. And Dr. Millman and I have the same philosophy, so I'm so excited. We're going to talk about some of the questions that I've been getting on a regular basis in terms of digestion. We're going to talk about inflammation. How do we really look at that? We're going to clear up all the controversy with vitamin K2. What's the research showing? As well as cortisol. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Millman here. Lots of great information. Stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Millman. I am so excited to have you here on the podcast. I always enjoy being with you, and you did such an amazing talk for the summit. And so many people, like I've gotten so many comments. Can you know? Can we have more of Dr. Millman? <laughs> Because the truth is there aren't many people who do this incredible integrative approach that you do and have had so much experience. And I think you're so hopeful because there's, there's so much hope. So welcome. Well, thank you so much. I, it's, uh, it's, we've been talking about having me on the podcast for a long, long time. So it's, it's very overdue. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of things overdue. Actually, before we even get talking, the one thing that I'm going to talk about later, we're going to mention, but I'm just so excited for it because the problem is there's only one of you and there just aren't that many, you know, integrative doctors who do the best of, you, you take the best of conventional medicine, you're a conventionally trained physician, aren't the best of integrative and functional medicine, all those tools and put it together. And you've done that for 15 years. And so I, I wish, you know, wish there was hundreds of you. And you only can see people in, in California. So I think it's so exciting that you've organized this amazing course that we're going to talk about to really help people figure out how they can, you know, utilize you in a different way and to really help them on their program. So we'll talk about that later. But I'm, I, I'm saying things long overdue. How long, Dr. Millman, have we been talking about a course that could help, you know, more people than just the one-on-ones that you see, right? I don't know, maybe eight years. <laughs> I know we've actually known each other for quite a while. So anyway, so I'm really yeah. excited about this. So let's yeah. get started. What I wanted, to, what I wanted you to share with people today, what we're going to do, there were numerous questions about integrative approach after the summit. And I wanted, I asked Dr. Millen if she could come on the podcast and really just go through some of the concepts and some of the areas people, people had asked me questions about. So that's what we're going to do. So let's just start out with, you know, people don't really know what an integrative approach looks like. You know, what, what are all the things? Because as you and I both know, and I, I hate to say this, but it's the truth. It's not a quick fix when it comes to really proper care and proper treatment for osteoporosis and effective. So this integrative approach has been very effective. So why don't you just explain, you know, what it looks like if someone wants to, you know, deal with bone loss or osteoporosis, you know, from an integrative approach? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, one of the biggest takeaways for, for me and uh, practicing 
over 15 years is there are really no patterns and everyone is different. And I think the other big thing is there are multiple factors at play almost all the time. And it has to be really individualized and comprehensive for it to work. Um, just, you know, going through the seven main causes of uh, root causes of bone loss um, include digestive issues, nutrient deficiencies, um, especially in the, the minerals area and the fat soluble uh, vitamins, uh, hormones. Some are too high, like thyroid, parathyroid, and cortisol, and some are too low, like estrogen and testosterone. And inflammation, which can be a huge culprit for almost all chronic diseases, and there are so many sources of inflammation. Uh, blood sugar issues, stress, uh, stress drives cortisol up, lack of exercise. I know that you know about that one. Um, but I think what's really important is that the health of your bones represents the health of your whole body. One of the things that I say is that the skeleton is a a storage place for minerals and nutrients. And so these critical organs like your brain, your heart, um, the things that keep you alive and you have to if and if you're in survival mode, these nutrients get stolen from the bones. And so you have to address these other issues that are going on with the body. But what I think is so important is that as you work on these root causes, you may have less, uh, less pain, a uh, better mood, clear thinking, more energy. And it is really important to know that you can reverse bone loss and reduce your risk of fractures um, doing this integrative approach. And I know, Margie, you call this uh, the opportunity. I really do. I think people need to reframe. You know, I look at a diagnosis because a lot of times people will feel okay or they won't have any, you know, it's not as though you, you broke a bone. You know, I mean, some people find out from a fracture, but for the most part, you get a bone density test and you get this diagnosis and, you know, people are af afraid. They have no idea what to do. And all of a sudden, you know, they conjure up the worst possible um, images of what's their life's going to be. And I think instead, look at it. It's an opportunity to look at your life, look at your health, what areas, just like you said, the bones aren't in isolation. So when something's going on with the bones, usually other parts of the body. And the good news, it's an opportunity to make changes. And as you can, as you can say, because you've been working with this for 15 years, when people do so many things get better and then they look back and they actually feel this was a blessing in disguise. So that's what I see all the time. And I, I feel very strongly about that. So that's the opportunity that exists for everybody. So the next I thing I wanted to ask, yeah, the next thing I, I want, <laughs> and, and I think that's, you know, that's what we're here to tell you. And that's why I had the summit because this is doable. We're not making this up. That's what I love about the work you do, Dr. Millman. I mean, 15 years working with people with osteoporosis during this approach, you've seen the benefits. Absolutely. So let, another question that I recently got, like how big a deal is digestion? You know, because a lot of the speakers on the summit talked about it. And from your perspective, because you deal with everything, you know, what percent of the people that you work with have digestive issues? And what's your feeling about, you know, really delving into the digestive issues when it comes to bone loss? Well, I would say uh, up around three quarters of the people have digestion issues. And I, it's the early part of the journey for me, because if your digestion isn't working, then how are you going to absorb the nutrients that are going to feed your bones? And it's a huge source of inflammation. Um, and so I feel like um, what I do is I first look at, in, in, in my integrative approach, I always do three things. I look at the symptoms uh, that are responsible and that point towards certain problems. I look, I do conventional lab tests that you can have your doctor order for you, or you can get direct to consumer labs. And then I dive um, deeper with the functional medicine labs. 
So when I look at digestion, I first break them up into upper digestive symptoms and lower digestive symptoms. Upper symptoms being nausea, vomiting, heartburn, um, right upper quadrant pain, burning in the stomach. These are basically your upper digestion. So lower digestive symptoms include gas and bloating, constipation, diarrhea, and also pain in the abdomen. And I really have people look at their poops because it can be a good indication of how your digestion is working. So perfect poops need to be solid, not mushy. Uh, they should be medium brown. They should have the length of um, between your wrist and your elbow is how long uh, your a perfect poop should be. And, and it should uh, not, you should not be straining. I should come, come out easily and it should be easy to wipe off. Um, things that are abnormal would be urgency or something, the poops that look pellety or floaters. Uh, the floaters are, are, are they, they float um, on the water of, of your toilet bowl. Mushy, these are not normal poops. You know, it's so important because I think most people, a lot of people do have issues and it's not something people utilize as a tool, but it really is. And it really gives good information and it's not okay. I can't even tell you how many people will say, oh, I go every two, three days. That's not okay. Or, you know, so all of these, I, I think so many people live with digestive issues and they just think, ah, not a problem. But as you're saying, it is a problem. And the good news is once you address them, so many things can get better. So I'm so glad that you brought that up and really talked about the differences that people can see. Yeah, and really, I, I look at treatment strategies being a different for the upper gut symptoms than for the lower gut symptoms. Um, and, and some of the things that can cause these kinds of problems are lack of digestive enzymes. And there are different, uh, different, in, different enzymes for carbohydrates and fats and for proteins. And people might be missing um, one or all of them. Like, for example, if you have floaters, it means that you're malabsorbing fat and it's the fat that's make, making uh, your poops float. And there's a digestive enzyme called lipase. And so that might be a deficiency that you're having. And you can just add a little bit of lipase um, and take that during your meals and break down your fat um, appropriately. And let's remember that our two very, very important fat-soluble nutrients for the bones are vitamin K and vitamin D. So if you're not breaking down your fat, you're not absorbing those vitamins very well as, as well. There can also be an imbalance between the unfriendly and the friendly flora that we have in our gut. And so this can cause um, things like SIBO, CIFO, and CIPO, so that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, and small intestinal parasitic overgrowth. And I often see fungal overgrowth because fungus growth, the fungus will feed on sugar and a lot of people have excess sugar in their diet and also because antibiotic use will encourage fungal growth. I often look at food sensitivities. Gluten and dairy are really big ones, but also egg and corn and even nuts can cause um, food intolerances and those are inflammatory and the body can't break them down. And so you need more digestive enzyme capacity to break down a food that you're intolerant to. And of course, it's a good idea to take that out of your diet so that your, your digestive system can um, be rid of that inflammation and have a chance to heal. Um, and I also do some specialized testing um, when it comes to digestion. I do uh, food intolerance testing, which is through the blood. And I also do a fancy poop test, which is called the GI map. And the GI map looks at it's actually a quantitative PCR that tells me how much of the good guys are there and how much are of the bad guys are there. And so you can see things like Giardia and H. pylori, and you can see um, it, how good um, your, your friendly flora is. And then there's some really helpful intestinal markers, which 
are calprotectin, which is the inf inflammation in your gut, secretory IgA, which is the immune system that's in your gut. We know that over 70% of our immune system is in our gut. So that can be really, really helpful. Um, and it's a bit pricey, but if you've had digestive issues for decades and things are not getting better, it's a very good investment. Um, and that's something that we're going to be doing in the program is, is some of these markers. You know, I think it's so, it's so important because if what I see is that people can have a couple things. Number one, if you have digestive issues and you're put on a medication, you know, like the bisphosphonates, which, which actually can irritate and aggravate digestive issues. You know, that's not a good situation. Like we need to know and need to deal with this. And I think that too often it's not even brought up. So I think what you're talking about is so important. And it's great that you do all the testing to figure out what exactly it is so you can treat it appropriately. But so what I'd yeah, love you to do. And, yeah. and how many people are put on PPIs for heartburn, right? And and that is supposed to be a short-term medication, and often people can't get off of the PPIs. It's sometimes very difficult to do that, but those are upper GI symptoms, and we have treatment strategies for them. Yeah, I think that's the sad thing. The sad thing is that, you know, why that you're right, people are put on them, and then they don't realize, and they're on them for, you know, a tremendous amount of time, and it is known that they're, they increase the risk of osteoporosis. It's very well known. And it's, it's very, it's very unfortunate. But the good news for everybody listening is there are, other, just like you said, there are other treatments for this. So not to just get off of it right this minute, you really need to, you know, figure out with your doctor or what other things are possible, but such a good point. So what I'd love you to do, you have so many amazing tips. So why don't you share one tip for the digestion that everybody listening can put into their life? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, well, you know, these days, uh, bone broths are are kind of all the craze, and uh, I think they can be very healing, but I want to tell you the difference between a meat stock and a bone broth, because I think that for a lot of people, uh, and in the beginning of their um, digestive health journey, that really they should be doing a meat stock and not a bone broth. So meat stock um, is is cooked for a much uh, less lesser period of time than a bone broth. And meat stocks have a lot of gelatin in them, which is fully hydrolyzed collagen. And that collagen is very easily to um, assimilate and it's very bioavailable. So that helps to um, feed the digestive lining and the connective tissue and the di digestive lining uh, can repair. Um, and it also provides skin, uh, provides nutrition to your skin, your arteries, and to your bones. So um, bone broths contain higher amounts of amino acids and minerals, and they can also contain glutamates. And glutamates can, pe can make people anxious. And so for this, for this reason, uh, we like to start people off with meat stocks. And meat stocks, um, I have a simple recipe for you that I do. Um, I basically do it about every five days and I have at least a cup of meat stock every day. So I'm going to give you a simple recipe for chicken stock. So I use, um, what you wanna do is use some of the uh, parts of the, the chicken that are very high in cartilage. So I am a big believer of using chicken feet and that gives you a lot of, of, of good cartilage. And, and so you take the whole chicken, um, it would be better for the chicken to be pasture raised and uh, free of um, not, not eating grains. And, and you add six chicken feet to a stock pot. You cover that with filtered water and put one to two teaspoons of salt in it. You put that on the, um, the stove to boil. Once it's boiled, you bring it down to a simmer and you simmer it covered for two hours. Then you strain it. You take the, the meaty parts off of the, the chicken, let it cool for a while before you do that. And then you strain the broth. And what you wanna do is, I have a big mason jar big mason jar about this big 
Uh, I strain it, um, I ladle it into the mason jar because if you pour it into the mason jar, you'll probably break the glass. So you want to ladle it in and that will allow the glass to warm up and you won't break it. And um, then you let it cool um, to room temperature, put it in the refrigerator. And after you, after it, it, after it's, it's come to, um, it's cooled down, you're going to see this beautiful gelatin and you're, there's going to be a little bit of fat on the top. And literally when you use those chicken feet, um, you can literally see the, the meat stock just jiggle with gelatin. And that's like, that's, that's the golden, that's the golden collagen that, that you want to, you want to, um, have 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 that at least a cup a day for healing digestion and having all of these other great properties for your health. You know, I love that. So where do you recommend people get the feet? Because you can't usually get the feet in the supermarket. Yeah. So I use a company called US Wellness Meats and they're online and they have pasture raised chickens. They have they have so many sources of different kinds of, of meat. Um, there's grass-fed beef and and lamb and um, beautiful chicken. It, it's it's a wonderful company. Oh, that's great. Oh, well, thank you for that good tip. I have to be honest. I have not put feet into mine, so I am going to start that right away. That sounds great. And it's really interesting because I don't think most people know the difference between the bone broth and and you know what you said about the meat broths. That's you know that's the meat stock. It's so interesting. Okay, something else that I'd love for you to talk about because inflammation, we know inflammation is the source and root cause of so many issues that are that are increasing the breakdown of our bone and responsible for osteoporosis. But you have an interesting way and a lot of people will ask, well, I don't know if I'm inflamed. And besides looking at lab work, which you're going to talk about, tell us a little bit about your method because I like the method you start at the top of your head. Just explain to everybody how you sort of, you know, assess inflammation? Yeah, I have this top-down approach where um, uh, I'll be talking to a patient and I want to know whether they have any known infections or if they feel swollen in any of these areas. So I start at the head and so the sinuses, whether you have any sinus pressure or any sinus pain, whether you have any gum disease or known tooth decay that you haven't dealt with, whether you have frequent sore throats, um, the lungs, whether you have a chronic cough or you're wheezing, you have asthma, uh, do you have chest pain for uh, looking at cardiovascular health, and then all of the digestive symptoms that we talked about, I ask about those. Then I go to the bladder. Do you have a frequent urinary tract infections or do you have pain over the bladder. And then I think about the musculoskeletal system. So do you have pain in your muscles? Do you have um, joint aches? Do you, are your, or your joints red and swollen? Do you feel like they're stiff? And, um, and that, you know, could be an autoimmune cause or it could just be osteoarthritis. But, and then once person has um, told me, specified where their particular feeling either infected or or they're feeling inflamed, then we can target a treatment to those areas. Um, and there's some testing that I do for um, inflammation. Um, so uh, the and I wanted to also cover the big the biggest sources of, of inflammation. Besides digestive issues, there's toxins. So there could be chemicals or heavy metals, there could be mold. Um, there could be, a um, person could be smoking. Stress causes inflammation because high cortisol causes inflammation, um, autoimmunity, and, and infection. So, and also blood sugar issues. So I measure the inflammatory markers like highly sensitive CRP, which is really pretty nonspecific. And um, the uh, sedimentation rate. And usually I only check that if somebody has um, some joint issues um, and because it's not usually, it's not usually elevated unless somebody has uh, um, problems with their joints. 
a ferritin, which is um, a ferritin and homocysteine and um, and insulin. So with ferritin, um, that is called an acute phase reactant when it's very elevated. And then when it's not elevated, it's, it's, it's an indication of your iron storage. And then um, homocysteine, I'm going to be getting into a little bit later. And insulin is inflammatory. Yeah, can we just talk about insulin for a second? Because everybody gets their blood glucose checked, you know, just the one time. And, and they'll give you a value. But I, I don't see many doctors ordering insulin unless someone has diabetes or unless they're seeing someone for that. You want to just explain why that's so important, the insulin? Yeah, well, the insulin goes up first. So you might have a perfectly optimal uh, fasting glucose or A1C, and you could still be insulin resistant. And, you know, that that range goes from zero to I can't, I can't remember the exact number, but it's around 25. Your sweet spot is two to five. So if you're above five, then you're starting to become insulin resistant, which means that the receptors on your cells need more and more insulin in order to drive the, the glucose from your blood into your cells. And so if you become insulin resistant, that's a bad thing because insulin is, is inflammatory. So that's an easy um, a marker to look at. And most people do not have optimal insulin levels. And it can be a big reason why people are overweight and they can't lose weight. You know how often I, I just see it. What I see, which is so upsetting, is that conventional doctors, unless it's diabetes, even if it's pre-diabetes, they're like, they don't really do much until it becomes like instantly you have something terrible where that's not the case. It's a progression. But I see it so common that people don't even realize that they're even in the pre-diabetes range just from fasting glucose and A1C. So is that what you, do you see that it's so common as well? Well, I mean, you can catch problems even before pre-diabetes, right? Um, I'll just give you um, an example. Um, I have a patient who has optimal glucose numbers, so 80 to 90 fasting, and an A1C of 5.2, which is quite good, and then her insulin is 10. So she's starting to become insulin resistant, and so this is the right time to intervene, right? Not not at the point where they're they're actually pre-diabetic. And the good news is there's so much that can be done. So I'm so glad. I, I love that you look at all these pieces. And I think it's just so important for people to be aware of it because it really isn't looked at until down the road where then it's so much harder to make. You can, but it's so much nicer when you can find out early on and prevent problems. Yeah. And in my practice, I'm using more and more the continuous blood glucose monitors where you, oh my gosh, they're so informative. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I want to say something actually, because, yeah. uh, you know, my, I have a son who has type one diabetes and I noticed on my lab work, I was starting to get into the pre-diabetes range and my diet was just so fabulous. I'm thinking, what could this possibly be? And so I decided, and my son wears a continuous glucose. I said, you know what? Or he was the one that says, mom, just why don't you check it out with that? Because you'll get the most informative, it was just, you know, to explain what it is, but it was so wonderful because I saw, for me, it was, I was eating too much fruit and I wasn't balancing it out with fiber. So making some minor changes made all the difference, but every person's different. So I think it's incredible actually. and so helpful, but yeah, share yeah, your experience. I mean, you know, your kryptonite food could be an apple, right? And you don't know it. And just by adding a little bit of some almond butter and a little bit of cinnamon, you know, that can blunt that, that carbohydrate response. And the other thing that you can do uh, is go for a 10 minute brisk walk and, and you can literally see how much that walk is going to bring down your glucose, which is amazing. And then that's po positive reinforcement. And you're going to love this one too. If, if stress is the thing that is, um, is driving your glucose up, you can just do a little bit of deep breathing or some meditation and you can watch how, how that affects your glucose, which is really pretty powerful. You know, I have to say something. 
So I began up in the morning. And if I started to worry, I have some de- techniques I do it in, in my bed even before I get up with energy. But if I was worried about something, instantly it would go up, which was so amazing. But after my, two things happened, after my meditation, I mean, it would probably go down like 15 points. It was amazing the difference with the stress reduction techniques and the exercise, the strength training made all the, just like you said, if you did eat something and you went for, you know, if I went biking or I did something, the exercise was critical. And it is in my life to keep things, you know, it, to keep things in good shape, but you can see it. And it, the best, re- so I'm such a big fan of this. I just, I think it gives you way more information than anything else. Yeah. So continue. Yeah, I could talk about this because really, really, really powerful. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that when it gets complicated is is when you've got multiple areas where you might have some chronic infection or inflammation. And, you know, what do you what do you attack first? So I'm always going to look at the gut first. And um, but then I also ask my patient, you know, because they've got good intuition, like what is bothering you the most? And then we kind of attack that. And one of the things that I really want to bring up is let's say that you have some sinus issues or you've got periodontal disease. How how is that going to affect your gut? Because it's that bacteria is going to keep seeding your gut. And as you're working on trying to get rid of these unfriendly flora, if you've got sinus problems, it, this may not clear up for you. So I I really like to look at the the whole picture right? And see where your potential failure points are. And that, that's, that's one for the gut is the sinuses and, and your gut and gum disease. So you've got to attack that. Yeah, that's so great. Do you have any, any suggestions, any tips for chronic gum disease? Because that's so prevalent. I have the greatest tip ever, actually. The, this, this, um, this product line that I want to tell you about is something that I have patients who are crazy about this stuff. Um, and so it's called Briotech, B-R-I-O-T-E-C-H. And it's hypochlorous acid, and you can get it in a couple of different forms. Hypochlorous acid is something that our white blood cells make to kill microorganisms. And this stuff is so powerful that it can even cause mad cow disease. It's, we know nothing else that can kill mad cow disease. And so the hypochlorous acid comes in a couple of different forms. There's SOS, which is super, super oxidizing saline, and that you can use as an oral hygiene rinse. And then there's also the, so you can do that um, after you brush your teeth in the morning um, and, and just swish it in your mouth and, um, and spit it out. And then there's also a topical skin spray. And the topical skin spray, everyone should have both of these things in their medicine cabinet because wounds, um, like an open wound, you just, you spray the topical skin spray on the open wound, it'll heal twice as fast and it won't get infected. It's so much better than Neosporin. And the other thing that, that the topical skin spray is amazing for is acne. So these two products are like, I learned about these from Dr. Klinghart about five years ago, and they're just, I mean, our, my patients go crazy over this stuff because it know, works. It's, so- it's really funny because, I, I mean, I'm learning something today, too, because I learned about it from Dr. Christine Schaffner, the Brio Tech, and, um, but using it more just to like whenever I'm in a crowd or something like that, I'll just spray it as a protective to kill any of the um, organisms. So more in terms of preventing issues, but this is a whole nother way to, to utilize it. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. The, and and the, they're slightly different products, right? So the SOS is, um, it, that's uh, more in tune with the pH of the mouth and the concentration is different than the to- topical skin spray. And Dr. Sh- Dr. Schaffner used to work with Dr. Klinghart. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, that's, that's that connection. Um, yeah. I have, this patient and she she literally will spray it on people who are coughing that come into her cubicle at work. Yeah, you know, that's how I learned about it actually from other practitioners who were, you know, and, and Dr. Schaffner who had purchased it actually is funny because 
Dr. Schaffner was on my podcast, I guess, and I had gone to a myofascial therapist. And this is like in the very beginning of COVID, you know, and so she's spraying it all over. And I said, oh, what's that? She goes, oh, I learned about it from you know, because of your podcast. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Anyway, so so I ended up buying it. So and, in, yeah. in the beginning, I really didn't know, you know, what was going to happen with COVID, right? And um, I had some mold in my house, and I was talking to Doctor Klinghart, and he said, "Get the get the SOS or the no, he actually either one, a topical skin spray or the SOS. Put it in a humidifier because this stuff will kill mold." And so. And then we would um, humidify areas to, to try to kill the mold. And and then when COVID came around, I was like, well, it kills like all this other stuff. So it probably is going to kill the virus. I wasn't sure. And so I would literally, literally in my clinic, like once a day, go around with the humidifier with, with the... <laughs> That's so funny, but this sounds I mean, great because so many... Didn't people... know. <laughs> yeah, but so many people have issues... Um... With, with this mouthwash. This is just, I'm so glad to hear this. Wow. So yeah. interesting. Okay. Anything else before we move on? Anything else you want to say about inflammation? I love the way you address it and the testing and, you know, you, you need to figure it out. You can't just, you know, it's not like you can just take something to calm inflammation because it will continue. You need to really figure out the root cause like you do. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. I do have Natural anti-inflammatories that I recommend, um, Designs for Health has Inflammatone, which is a very nice product. And and I I will give those things to to patients um, while they're in their transition point. You know, everyone, I think everyone pretty much knows that turmeric isn't a good anti-inflammatory. Um, and so the Inflammatone has a fair amount of turmeric and boswellia, ginger, rosemary, things like that. So they can yeah. be helpful. Yeah, no, it's so important. But I think long term also, sometimes people just, you know, don't even look at what could be causing it. So I love that you do both. You help calm it down as well as trying to figure out what's going on. Right. All right. So let's, I want, I want to dig deeper into something you mentioned before about high cortisol, because this is such a big issue with osteoporosis. And I see this all the time. And I think it's something that that we need to look at more carefully because it's, you know, and it's not. People just sort of, you know, accept it. So why don't you just share your thoughts on high cortisol and how you look at it in terms of the testing? Okay. So, you know, high cortisol is is basically um, analogous to of prednisone and steroids. And we know that steroids break down bone at, at an alarming rate. And the, our cortisol is secreted by our adrenals. So if we're under chronic stress, our adrenals um, can get a little bit burned out. Um, and um, symptoms of high cortisol, at first I look at symptoms, could be insomnia, anxiety, heart racing, belly fat accumulation, diarrhea, um, and your intuition, think about um, your intuition is probably telling you if stress is a problem in your life. So um, cortisol has changes throughout the day. It's called a diurnal variation. And it should start um, highest in the morning and lowest at night. And then this is just in reverse of what you see in melatonin. So melatonin is the lowest in the morning and highest at night. And so what um, I like to look at the, the salivary cortisol and the, the variation that it has within the day. So what I do is I use the Dutch Complete and the Dutch Complete uh, does both hormones and cortisol. They have something called a cortisol awakening response. This is looking at the uh, pattern of the cortisol when you first wake up and at 30 minutes and at 60 minutes. It's like a little mini stress test for your adrenals. So you can see if it's flatlined or if, it, if it's, there's an exaggerated response. For the bones, we're, we're really looking at um, the exaggerated response. And then sometimes at night, cortisol can be high and that can 
lead to insomnia. So there are some good strategies for being able to dampen cortisol um, with some adrenal adaptogens, um, but you have to be careful with them. I mean, whenever I'm talking to people about herbs, I'm always thinking about who cannot take these herbs. I'll just give you um, a quick example. One is rhodiola. Rhodiola is actually estrogenic. So we don't want to give rhodiola to somebody who's had a history of breast cancer. Um, there are also you know, people who are on blood thinners. Um, that's the, There's many herbs that, that can cause a thinning of the blood. And so that can be dangerous in these people. But I also use amino acids like GABA and L-theanine to help calm down that um, high cortisol at night it can be really helpful for, for, for people. Yeah, that's great. Is there anything? Um, yeah, I think it's so, it's so important because it's not that you can just get the blood test, you know, one time. If you just get one time cortisol, you're really lacking all that information. It's not going to, it's not going to tell you the whole picture at all. Before we leave cortisol, is there any other tips that you want to share about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a huge one, I think, um, which is that the adrenals, when they're chronically stressed, they are, they are putting your nutrients um, that they require in high demand. And these are exactly the same nutrients that you, you want to be feeding your bones. And they include vitamin C, um, all the B vitamins, but especially B12 and folate, calcium, magnesium, trace minerals. Um, and um, so you want to make sure that if you're chronically stressed, you may need extra of these vitamins. And so one of the things that I do is I look at something called the homocysteine pathway. And what's interesting about it is that you can look at the functionality of especially B12 and folate. So it's not, it's, so the functionality of B12 and folate is important because it's not just that you need these nutrients, but you need them to be functional in the body. So there's a gene called um, MTHFR, and that is um, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. And that takes folate and it converts it into the active form, which is 5-MTHF. Well, 50% of Caucasians have this mutation and they can't convert their folate. So when this happens, homocysteine gets elevated. And remember, homocysteine is an inflammatory marker. So I am... I'm looking at homocysteine as well as the B12 and the folate level in the blood to determine if there's functional problems. And then the other thing that um, I think is really important is that some patients will bring in their B complex and their B, B complex has folic acid in it. Well, that is actually the synthetic form of folate. And I often tell my patients to throw that B complex in the garbage because that's not a good form of folate to take. And then the other thing is when, with respect to B12. So um, B12, a lot of B complexes have cyanocobalamin in it. Cobalamin is the B12 part of it. Um, and cyano turns it into cyanide. So that's another form of B12. Uh, it, it, that's another um, thing that's in B complexes that is not the right form of, of, the, of the B12 for you to be putting in your body. And the other thing is that B12 needs to be activated as well. So I'm recommending uh, methylcobalamin, hydroxocobalamin, and adenosylcobalamin. And I actually really like um, the combinations of them. Um, but uh, when homocysteine is over eight, this is when you want to start thinking about functionality of your B vitamins. And just remember, if you're chronically stressed, you need more B vitamins and all of these other nutrients to, to really feed your adrenals. And once your adrenals are fed well, then they can 
stay on track a little bit better and deal with chronic stress. It's such a good point. So something I just want to say about the homocysteine, that's going to affect the collagen. I mean, it affects the cross links in the bone. It makes it stiffer. So it's really important. I mean, it's a, it's a very important marker to look at. And the problem is if you're looking at your labs, it will say normal up until I think 15 at something, right. you know, so the, so the optimal level is you need, you need to look at this or, or work with your doctor on it, because if you're just seeing what turns red, it will not because that's considered normal, but yet so many problems happen way before that. So that's a really good point. Okay. Right. And, and, and anybody can, you know, improve their nutrition, right? You don't have to worry about, you know, uh, contraindications, right? And will people That's be the first able thing on, you should do. Yeah, on That's the, the supplement, they will be able to see what type of, um, of you know, the, the different forms of the B vitamins as if they just read the supplement, the ingredients. Yeah, you should always do that for B complex, especially. Okay. Okay. So now the next question is something really important. And I recently did a Q&A where I had over 300 questions asked to me after the summit. And I would say probably 10, even though this was discussed on some people are still confused. And you did such an amazing job of delving into the research on the summit that I wanted you to share this with everybody on the podcast, because I think it's so important. Just an update on vitamin K2 and the different research and the different forms and your thoughts on this. Yeah, of course. I think uh, vitamin K and um, me recommending the right form of vitamin K that has so much data on uh, preventing fractures, reducing fracture risk has been probably my secret sauce for 15 years. Um, I did this research very early on and it, you know, it's emerging uh, and you've got to keep up on it to see uh, what the latest trends are. And, and so um, there are three types of main types of vitamin K. So there's vitamin K1 and vitamin K1 mostly goes to the liver and it's important for blood coagulation and blood clotting. And it is cleared very rapidly from the circulation. And then there's vitamin K2 and there's two forms, two main forms. There's actually many, many forms of vitamin K2, but um, there's MK4 and MK7. And um, we've known for some time that the Japanese have a lower fracture risk and higher bone densities than some people in other countries. Um, there's a study that was done looking at Japanese people who had who who ate a fermented soybean product called natto uh, and found that they had a lower risk of fractures. So they did a study. So they looked at people who were eating uh, one to six packs of natto compared to those who were eating none. And this is in a week. Uh, and they found that they had a 21% decreased risk of fractures. And those people who were eating over seven packs per week of natto had a 44% reduced risk of fractures. And this, and they also showed that there was a, uh, an improvement in the bone mineral density of the neck of the hip. So this is important because natto um, has a lot of MK7 in it. Um, but what... What you should also realize is that natto also has some isoflavones and genistein that can be helpful for bone building. So it's a synergistic combination, um, but that is some evidence that MK7 might be helpful for um, preventing fractures. And then uh, one of the things is that um, since vitamin K1 um, is rapidly taken up, um, and cleared out of the circulation, the main job that vitamin K2 is doing um, and, and helping the bones to regenerate and, um, and have good bone mineral density is there's a protein called, called osteocalcin that's in the blood. And vitamin K2 helps to activate osteocalcin. So its main job is to take calcium from the circulation and bring it into the bones. So when it's activated and it's, it's carboxylated, when the osteocalcin is carboxylated, 
then the calcium gets shuttled. Uh, and that is vitamin K dependent. And it's mostly vitamin K2 that does this. We don't do know that vitamin K1 can convert into MK4, but, but I read a study that, that concluded that a deficiency of K2 could not be allevi alleviated with vitamin K1 supplementation. So it's really vitamin K2 that we are looking for to um, help that process of osteocalcin being carboxylated. But there is da extraordinary data on MK4. And this is when I started my practice. I knew about this study that was done in 2006, and it was a meta-analysis, which means they pull the data from seven different Japanese studies. And these were pharmaceutical doses of MK4. So it was 15 milligrams that was taken three times a day. And what they found was pretty extraordinary. The reduction in fracture risk for vertebral fractures for those in the spine was 60%. Those for hip fractures, a reduction of 70%. And for non-vertebral fractures, so this would include the wrist and the hip, 76%. And these numbers really rival any medication that, that is out there. Um, in 2007, um, they had a study that showed 45 milligrams per day of MK4 for three years improved the hip bone geometry, and, but it didn't improve the bone density. Um, but this was interesting because they measured how la large the bone was, and they found a significant increase in the femoral neck width. Now, the femoral neck of the hip is the area that's most vulnerable because it, it's very slender in that area. So what they found was that, that that bone actually got bigger. But we have to think about well, why wouldn't the bone mineral density actually improve if the bone gets bigger and stronger? That's because of the way that densities are calculated. So density is something, and in um, the bone mineral density, it's the mineral content, so the bone mineral content, divided by the surface area of the bone that you're looking at. So the surface area got bigger, and if the bone mineral content it gets bigger at, with the same ratio, the bone mineral density being the mineral content divided by the area is going to stay the same. And if the bone mineral content doesn't increase as much as the, the area does, the bone mineral dens density can actually decrease. So... I think that that is one of the reasons why um, in some studies, uh, the bone mineral density does not increase with vitamin K, but, but we know that the strength is increasing. Now, we don't know as much about MK7 as we do for MK4, but some research is promising. And what's nice about MK7 is it has a much higher, um, longer half-life. So it has a half-life of about 72 hours compared to two hours for MK4. This is the reason why we give MK4 two to three times a day and MK7, we only need it need to give it one time a day. And MK7 has much uh, smaller doses. It's in the micrograms instead of the milligrams. So we don't know about the right dose for MK seven yet. But there was a study done in 2013 that looked at 180 micrograms per day. Um, and that was taken for three years. And what they found was that it preserved the height of the vertebra in the lower thoracic region of the spine. It preserved the lumbar spine bone, bone mineral density, and it improved the bone strength at the femoral neck. So that's very encouraging. And then um, quite recently in 2022, another study was evaluating um, all forms of vitamin K. So they, they pooled studies, including MK4 and MK7, and it was a huge amount of data showing a significant improvement in lumbar spine uh, bone mineral density. But it was not, it was not that 
bone mineral density improvement was not seen for the hip, the femoral neck, or the forearm. But it did show a significant overall reduction in fracture risk. So at this point, um, I would not go so far as to say that uh, I would recommend MK7 at this point, but um, the the data needs to um, be a little more convincing for me. Okay. Oh, and another thing I wanted to mention too was that um, we are seeing evidence that vitamin K supplementation doesn't isn't just good for the bones, but it's good for heart disease to prevent heart disease, osteoarthritis, kidney stones, diabetes neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, and even some forms of cancer like liver cancer and pancreatic cancer. There's some data on it, and it's really very impressive. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Another question was asked, well, what about combining both of them? I know they haven't really looked at that. You know, when you combine, can people take both MK7 and MK4? So, um, one of the things that I read about MK7 is that it could be a problem with those people who are on blood thinners if it's at a dose of over 50 micrograms per day. Um, so, And they've done the same studies on MK4 and not found any problems with it um, thickening the blood. And so then there would be problems with um, anticoagulants that are not um, related to vitamin vitamin K. So I would, at this point, we just really don't know. Uh, I, I, if my recommendation in my clinic is to take 30 milligrams of MK4, splitting it up 15 milligrams in the morning, 15 milligrams at night. The reason why I don't do three, 15 milligrams three times a day is because I just feel like Taking something three times a day is is difficult to do. I don't have many patients who really can do three times a day day dosing. So, but most people can take uh, their supplements in the morning and at night. And so, um, if there's a little bit of MK seven with some D three, because a lot of supplement brands combine them, I'm not going to worry about about like fifty micrograms of of vitamin um, MK7 with 30 milligrams of MK4, but I just don't think that the research is there. Okay, great, thanks. All right, oh my gosh, we've talked about so many things, but one thing I really am excited about you sharing is, you know, cause it's confusing. I think the important thing for everybody to know is that there's so much that can be done and You've had such good results. You want to just talk a little bit about your results for a second before we even, why don't you talk about two things? What, yeah. you know, your results and also now how people can work with you and about your course, because as I said, I've been on your case for like eight years, if you could, if we could do something so more people could have access to you, your information and, you know, this phenomenal integrative approach. So why don't you share those, those two things? Yeah. So, um. You know, as of today, I've treated over 600 uh, women with osteoporosis and osteopenia, and I have had six fractures in my clinic over a 15-year period of time. So it's it's a roughly 99% um, success rate in preventing fractures. Um, so I I do think that this work. And and I'll, I'll be I'll be totally honest. Not everyone has improvements in bone mineral density, but my fracture success is is really I think is 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 pretty phenomenal. Um, and you know I um, you know I could talk hours and hours of, about um, about about this stuff, but um, you know there really just is not enough time in a, in podcast episodes, and there's so much to go over. And I know that everyone can't come to California to see me. And quite frankly, because of a lot of the um, excitement uh, around the talk that I gave in the summit, we're booked out until June for me seeing uh, private patients. And so 
what I decided to do was build a course that went through what I do as a functional medicine doctor specializing in osteoporosis. And I'm condensing can condensing what I'm doing for um that would take a six months of cl clinic visits down to 14 weeks. And what I'm doing um, is uh, the program is called Restore and Rebuild 100 Days to Healthier Bones. And it really follows the steps that I take in my clinical practice. I help you identify your own root causes by doing self-assessments, labs that you can do with your doctor, or even a deep dive functional medicine labs. I reveal my time-tested protocols to reverse these root cause and help you to grow stronger, more resilient bones and even reverse bone loss. So I promise there's enough time to in the course to do these things. The educational, the, the live sessions are half education and half question and answers. So you'll be able to um, bring your own unique situation to the table and get some advice about it. Um, and you'll have a step-by-step -step plan that will help include diet, lifestyle, and supplementation that are driven by your unique root cause root causes that we've identified during the program. And I I'm just, yeah. I'm actually really thrilled that Margie will be my special guest host for the last two sessions, one on exercise and one on happiness and stress reduction. Yeah, I'm just so excited about this course because. It, it really helps walk people, you know, walk you through. It's confusing. It's so confusing and it's so overwhelming. I mean, those are the questions that, though, those are the feelings that people have, you know, overwhelmed, like there's so much to do and there's so much information. Where do you start? And it's, it, it, you know, so that's what I love. You're going to break it down. Let's start with this and really walk people through what they need to do, whether they're working with their physician, whether they're wherever they're at in their journey, they can they can see what what needs to be done step by step. Yeah. So I'm just so excited to share that. And we'll have all the information. Is there's is there a link we can give or shall I just put it in the show notes? Um for sure put it in the, the show yeah. notes. I'll put all the a, you have it to say too. Yeah. Okay. Um so it's a bit B I T dot L Y forward slash R and R M B. Right. And because it means what, tell them what it means, the R and the initials. Oh, R and R is restore and rebuild. Restore and rebuild. Love that. And that's what you do. That's what you do. Wow. Well, I'm really excited about this. And if, and yeah, so we'll have all the information about that. And when's it starting, Dr. Melman? It's starting on June 15th. And so the registration is going to end on June 1st so that people can, I'm going to give out handouts about what labs I'm recommending to go through the, with the program. So then people will have enough time to get their labs. But if they don't get their labs, then they shouldn't be discouraged because there's going to be some catch up time so that, that um, uh, there's integration week. There's four integration weeks within the the modules, so so there's catch up time. You know, and I also love a couple of things. Number one, you don't have to do the labs because you're going to tell them other ways to assess, so that's optional. But number right. two is that you've done a lot of research on where's the cheapest way to get some of these labs that that they that that may they may not be able to just get right from you know their own blood work. So I have. Yeah, yeah, I know you've you've done that. I can't wait to see all that because that's such important information. Anyway, yeah, so I'm very excited about that, and I'm excited to be part of it and and add at the end the exercise as well as the stress reduction. So they're sort of getting the whole entire gamut of what needs to be done for an integrative approach. So, yeah, right. Well, thank you so much. Anything before we we end? I think I'd just like to to remind people that, you know, um, don't live in fear. Um, don't be hopeless. There are things to be done. Um, I have had so many patients who have felt completely different after 
starting the programs um, who've gotten better energy and and felt um, less anxious and 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 are completely hopeful uh, and and even um, and and I agree with you it, it is not a quick fix it does take time. Um, but the, here's another thing that I recommend to my patients. I recommend getting DEXA scans once a year and paying cash for them if their insurance doesn't pay for it because it's, it's not that it's it's not that expensive. And we, we do bone breakdown markers to look at the progress as well. So great it is. I, I've been working with this for over 25 years, and you know, as I, and I couldn't agree more. There's so much hope. And when you correct these things, your whole life will get better and you'll get happier too <laughs> and more energy. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here and sharing the, all, all this brilliance with all of us. And I'm, I'm always so grateful for everything that you do because I've learned a lot as well. So thanks so much. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Millman. She gave us some great tips that we can all put into our life. I am so excited about her new course. I've just, so many people have asked me, how do I work with Dr. Millman? How do I work with Dr. Millman? After, after hearing her on the summit. And unfortunately, she can only work one-on-one -on -one with people in California. So this is a way that to bring her fabulous integrative approach to many people. And I looked at the syllabus. I'm just really excited. I think she's, she just did a great job and it has so many good components. And I'm doing two modules as part of it as well. As she mentioned, I'm doing the exercise and one on stress reduction and happiness. So all the information will be in the show notes. And thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.